Hey there, I'm Mark, in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse, and yeah, J. Cole album bomb, might delete later, and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. There have rarely been weeks on the Hot 100 that feel simultaneously like they matter both more and less. On the one hand, there's a bunch of new arrivals that have intriguing histories and prospects that can generate conversation. On the other hand, about half of them are from a J. Cole album bomb that less than two weeks after its release does not remotely matter because its quality and his credibility imploded just about as fast. And I wish I could say I was remotely surprised. We'll get a lot more into it discussing certain entries where I will try to restrain myself from pointing at a series of album reviews from the past decade and shouting, I told you so! But suffice to say, Might Delete Later has not only lived up to its title in spades, it's the sort of album bomb where everyone should be grateful of Billboard's fleeting measures of impact. I do not expect it'll stick around, and probably for the better. So let's get to that top 10, where for yet another week, Like That by Future Metro Boomin featuring Kendrick Lamar has held the number one. I'm frankly stunned, but when the streaming is still so strong and it's on a legit radio run, even if it slips off the top spot in weeks to come, this is damn near historical for a diss track to have held this much cultural attention in the mainstream for so long. However, it is facing a very real meaty challenger and one I also didn't see coming, let alone picking up gains. Too Sweet by Hosier at number two. Right behind on streaming with better sales also getting shipped to radio, it could very well take the top spot next week. Now this places Beautiful Things by Benson Boone in a distinctly awkward position at number three because it has even better sales. It is surging on the radio, but it lags just enough on streaming that it might be slipping out of contention. I'm certainly not about to complain. At least Lose Control by Teddy Swim's got that top spot for one week. It's now at number four. Currently the top spot on radio and good streaming and sales, it just does not have that momentum to get any higher. But it does hold over Texas Hold'em by Beyonce down at number five, where post-album bomb, both radio momentum and streaming seems to be drying up a little bit. And then next we have a, well, let's call it interesting case with our one new song in the top 10, Seven Minute Drill by J. Cole at number six. Now we'll get into the song much more later on, but it should not be a surprise that this is only here because of streaming, where it no longer is. Because in following his Dreamville Fest apology, J. Cole took the song down, but only after it got a full tracking week of streaming because, well, you can't compromise those first week numbers now, can you? I would put money on this song not even being on the Hot 100 at all by next week, but until then we did see Lovin' On Me by Jack Harlow have a slight positional rebound at number seven, even as its radio is starting to fail. I expect it to be overtaken by We Can't Be Friends, Wait For Your Love by Ariana Grande at number eight, which doesn't really have a lot of streaming traction, but it is picking up a lot of radio to compensate. Will probably wind up being a mid-tier hit if it survives all of this. Then thanks to the streaming traction, Type Shit by Future, Metro Boomin, Travis Scott, and Playboy Cardi actually picked up a spot to number nine. And finally, thanks to a consistent radio and a surprising amount of streaming, Stick Season by Noah Khan is back at number 10. Kind of shocking it's had this longevity, but adult alternative radio will always keep tracks like this around and moving. Not that surprising. Now this takes us naturally to our losers and our dropouts, where the vast majority you can actually chalk up to album bombs that are failing. Hell, the only major dropout that's not tied to an album bomb in any way, it's X's by Tate McRae. It'll somehow clinch a year-end list spot, yay. Now with our losers, we're starting with Beyonce's debuts, with Two Most Wanted, with Miley Cyrus slipping down to 30, Jolene at 51, Levi's Jeans with Post Malone at 67, Bodyguard at 70, Tyrant with Dolly Parton at 88, Blackbird with Tanner Adele, Britney Spencer, Tierra Kennedy, and Raina Roberts at 90, Yaya at 93, and 16 Carriages at 100. Then we've got the losses for Future and Metro Boomin. Cinderella with Travis Scott at 37, Young Metro with The Weeknd at 56, and We Don't Trust You at 61, with the last remainder of Ariana Grande's album bomb with The Boy Is Mine down at 95. Man, she really thought that was going to do something, didn't she? Now, the only other contender continued loser is Mama's House by Thomas Rhett featuring Morgan Wallen down at 98, and even that feels a little more like a positional shift than a serious drop in production. 
that happens. Now this takes us neatly to our returns and our gains where as usual it is worthwhile paying attention to the label situations to see if the TikTok promo UMG feud is a serious factor. And looking at our returns, Let's Go by Key Glock at 99, We Ride by Brian Martin at 97, and Wine Into Whiskey by Tucker Wetmore, they're all under independent labels, they're immune to that UMG problem. And One Call by Rich Amiri, it aggregates under Warner at 96. Now for the gains, well, let's handle the mainstream country cases first, where Music Row is the bigger factor with Nashville Radio. So off the return, Back Then Right Now by Tyler Hubbard at 86. Tucson Too Late by Jordan Davis spiked to 80. Outskirts by Sam Hunt rose to 74. And Where It Ends by Bailey Zimmerman just surged up to 44. He's got TikTok on his side under Warner as well. And man, someone really wants a Morgan Wallen replacement. I can't complain. Where It Ends is a really good song. Then we got the two losses that rebounded, that being... Two Name by Fuerza Regida, Sony Music Latin there, and Slow It Down by Benson Boone at 40, seeing a nice boost from his album as well. Then going from the bottom up, Home by Good Neighbors rose to 85, Scared to Start by Michael Markegi hit 54, he's on Warner, Gotta Only by Floyd Minner and Chris MJ got another big spike to 48, also apparently they're independent. Yeah, Glow by Glorilla shot up to 39 thanks to streaming album impact despite her being on Interscope. It looks like someone knows how to promote somebody. And Austin by Dasha continues to rise to 32. Even without Music Row backing, she's got Warner and TikTok, that'll probably be enough. But of course, the big story here is that we're very much in album bomb territory for J. Cole and Might Delete Later, and it's just big enough with 12 new songs that it fits into the category where I'm only interested in the best, the worst, and the top 20. Outside of those, 3001 at 72, Trade the Truth in Ibiza at 66, Stealth Mode with Boz at 65, Pi with Daylight and Absol at 62. Amazing how some truly atrocious cancel culture and transphobic bars can tank a song where two phenomenal spitters can trade off. Fever at 59, Sticks and Stones at 53, probably the best song on the album. The fact I'm not covering it speaks volumes. Ready 24 with Cameron at 38, Pricey with Ari Lennox, Young Dro, and Gucci Mane at 29, and Hunting Wabbits at 28. So now for a more reasonable but still considerable list of new arrivals, and believe me, we will get to J. Cole. Number 94, Bulletproof by Nate Smith. You know, for as much as Nate Smith is charted, which isn't all that much for a mainstream country act without a more established fan base, but it's more than you might think or remember. Well, quite frankly, I wish I could remember more of his songs beyond wreckage, but hey, whatever. He's got a new EP. This is the lead-off song from it, and well, uh, that was certainly a choice though, that plucky twang and the faint drum machines before the stock country guitars rev up. But I'm more distracted by the utter lack of prominent bass groove and how weirdly touched up and or inorganic the vocals feel. And the lyrics really aren't much to write home about either. All the whiskey is not getting rid of the memory of his ex, no matter what all of his favorite country songs have said. A little bit ironic, because I don't even need whiskey to forget this exists in record time. Next, number 91, Magnetic by Islet. <laughs> So I guess we've now formally reached the era where the debut single from a K-pop act can actually hit the Hot 100 directly. And here we have, well, a group that was assembled out of a Korean reality show competition. I guess they should be grateful that given their under big hit, they figured out distribution rights to actually stay on TikTok and got some virality. And... Okay, look, some of the pieces are there in order to make this work. I like the fluttery keys juxtaposed against the pulsating heavier synths and the crisp whirring percussion. And the girlish vocals have enough character to be pretty likable, at least until they start chipmunking them on the stuttering post-chorus drop. But something still seems missing to me, and it's kind of tricky to pin down what it is. I mean, the lyrics are nothing to write home about, but what else is new? It's a pretty general yearning love song with magnetism as the central metaphor and opposites attract. I mean, I can get into the science, but you don't want to hear that. But you'd think it would also inspire some conflict within the song, and there's just 
very little of it. And when you pair that with the chirpy production that almost feels mechanical, it feels like I'm being sold the baseline of their formula without more to really back it up. I mean, it's far from bad. In terms of K-pop, I have certainly heard much worse. I'm just not sure it's all that special. At least not yet. Number 84, Halfway to Hell by Jelly Roll. I guess I shouldn't be surprised that Jelly Roll is continuing to push singles from that album last year after Need a Favor and Save Me really worked. And, and when I say worked, I mean commercially, not exactly for me. But hey, maybe something with a little bit more bluesy muscle might fare well for his voice, especially when you open up with that hollering preacher on the front and back end. And honestly, the acoustic groove ramping into the sizzling electric guitar as you get that jingling stomp, it is pretty damn effective. Maybe could afford a little bit more low-end presence in the bass line to balance out Jelly Roll's voice, as it can feel a little bit claustrophobic around his delivery, but that's pretty minor, especially when I think the hook's actually pretty good. Now the lyrics... Okay, you know what? I'll give him this. They feel evocative. They're rooted in that biblical struggle between heaven and hell and his tormented soul caught up in between. But a lot of it's more just description about Jelly Roll, not really telling us what he's done to get to that place. It's a cool description, but it may be feeling a little shallow without more muscle to really back it up. Still, it's probably the most I've liked a Jelly Roll single since Son of a Sinner. Yeah, I think it's decent, so hope it sticks around. Give it a shot. Number 77, Good Luck Babe by Chapel Roan. Well, isn't this a pleasant surprise? For those of you who don't know, I have been watching the steady breakthrough of Chapel Rome with a lot of interest, where despite not really having official formal TikTok promo, the combination of great word of mouth and touring with Olivia Rodrigo has given her a substantial amount of viral traction, where even her excellent debut album, The Rise and Fall of a Midwest Princess, it's seeing its best chart performance months after its release. And hell, it made my year-end list last year. That's awesome. Now, this song was not on that debut album. It appears to be a standalone single, and well, it's a little awkward now to say that I'm not completely head over heels for it, at least not for this one compared to Red Wine Supernova or Casual. Now, don't get me wrong, I still think it's really good. That glossy synth backing into the pulsating bass line and the drums ramping into the bridge alongside the soaring strings, it's impressive. I like the scale, and I really like the content. Or Chapel Roan has to regretfully end a connection with a woman where she wants it to be love, but said woman treats it as more of a cute dalliance because at the end of the day, she's going to end up marrying a man and ignore any of her deeper queerness because it's a lot harder to be out and proud than just pass off as being straight. And I really like how the blur of genuine hurt and anger as being used in this way colors Rowan's delivery, where the sarcasm of the song's title and choral line is tinged with some of that secondhand regret. Rowan has described writing the song as a flood of emotions, and it certainly does feel like that. So where do things go kind of astray for me? Well, it may come in the hook, where Rowan spends so much time in her trilling, Kate Bush-esque register that it doesn't quite have the fiery dynamics of her best. I get her showing off her excellent range, and man, she just belts her lungs out on that bridge. But it feels very trained in a way that the rest of the song's emotionality isn't. Granted, I know I'm nitpicking, I'm thrilled that she's charting with this regardless, and it's a really damn good song. Let's hope there's more to come. Hope you can check this out. Number 73, Helen Back by Bacar featuring Summer Walker. Me and you went to Helen Back just to find peace. I thought I had everything, I was lonely Now you're my everything, I was lonely so there's a story with how this song finally charted, and it goes back as far as 2019. The original version of this was released back off his debut EP, and actually had a run on the alternative charts in 2020, as well as doing some ridiculous numbers worldwide for the next year. It steadily racked up streaming traction, even as Bakar's other singles don't make much of an impression, including those for his 2022 debut album. So fast forward to last year, where the original makes a serious run for the Hot 100, but never gets out of the bubbling under. 
Bacar then puts out his second album last September and includes a remix of the song with Summer Walker, which now months later has finally caught on with enough viral traction to break through thanks to him being on Epic, which is under Sony. And you know what? I certainly get the appeal. The languid but spiky guitars off the supple bass and horns with the occasional whistle. Bacar's ragged delivery puts me a little in mind of Steve Lacey and the breezy feel of this love-struck reminiscence at the core. And on the remix, Summer Walker actually steps up for a rewrite of the second verse from the partner's perspective. And credit to her, she sounds way better than normal. With mastering that's a lot more organic and lush, it doesn't feel so overworked. Why can't she have this on her own albums? It's actually a really nice touch. It lends balance to a pretty damn good song. I mean, it took a while. I'm happy this crossed over in this form. Good stuff. Check it out. Number 60, Cry by Benson Boone. Go ahead and ruin someone else's life. Alright, look, I'm not gonna make a big deal about Benson Boone getting some album success. I don't like the songs, and one with that title didn't exactly spark joy for me, but hey, at worst it's a drippy ballad, right? Well, from the first few lines on the intro, I got that impression, and then the song changes. It picks up more driving, percussive crescendo in these choppy, over-compressed staccato guitars, where I think Boone's trying to do a vocal line that reminds me of Matt Bellamy of Muse with that falsetto, and he does not remotely have the power or charisma to sell that. I don't know who the hell on his team told him that continuing to jump wildly out of his vocal comfort zone conveys any intensity, but again, all I'm getting here is Lucas Graham at his screechiest, without anything close to support in the production to actually help him. And this is where I tell you, this is a breakup song, where he basically tells her to go cry about it, as he hates that how she blames her problems on her bad mental state, that she doesn't even know herself, let alone him, that she's a narcissist and not a misfit, and he's tired of letting her ruin his life, I guess. Here's the big problem. Not only does Benson Boone utterly fail at trying to sell this vibe, sounds like someone put a taser on his testicles, on the second verse, he literally says that he could be projecting and not seeing her side, or maybe she could just cry about it anyway. A line that is so douchey, it makes me mad that we got this charisma vacuum trying to sell it. You're not Adam Levine, you're not even Charlie Puth, dude. You sound like the worst sort of good guy trying to be bad and failing to even convey that. Somehow Shawn Mendes is beating you. Honestly, this might be Benson Boone's worst song on content alone, because if you're going to sell this condescending dickery, you need presence, you need composure, not sounding as if the sounding has gone very wrong. It's an absolutely fucking terrible song. I don't expect it's going to stick around. Thank God for that. Number 35, HYB by J. Cole featuring Boz and Central C. Every time we come outside, call the Uber SUV, how many gon' fit inside? Yeah, hide your bitch, hide your wife. Yeah. It would be J. Cole to give someone as trash as Central C a cosign on his album full of flexing and subs, and by in my opinion, by far the worst song here. From Boz quoting memes a decade old to highlight how they're stealing your girl, to the Sandy attempt at a UK drill beat that's utterly gutless alongside that faint guitar loop, to Central C doing his empty flexing routine where he's saying that you should thank him because he's just ignoring your girl. He could totally take her if he wanted. He's also traveling to places that he can't pronounce, and he's trying to flex as if he is interesting. I've seen him live at a festival. He's not. And yet somehow, I think J. Cole's verse is actually worse. Rattling off the alphabet, then skipping L, and pretending to have some sort of childish naivete as if he doesn't even know what an L is. That was terrible even before he apologized. Now it's pathetic on a different level. Then we also got the implication he could totally take your girl, and you should be lucky that he's faithful. I think I understand why folks hate Honey, I'm Good so much right now, but then you get the line that J. Cole hates goals. I mean, he's just got that inherent power to stack up the cash and win, according to him, and that's just so revealing of how much he just doesn't care to learn or grow. In other words, this is also trash. Let's continue to number 19, Crocodile Tears by J. Cole. Love if it costs 
Niggas hit my phone up when they need something. I can't recall a time when you gave me something. Yeah, I don't care for this one either. Why is T-minus giving Jay Cole this grainy klaxon over the piano line before the bass drops in for the second half of the verse until the metallic trap snare drops in after the first hook? It sounds like a headache in synth form. And look, we'll get to the whole aborted beef in a little bit. But one thing that emphatically becomes clear is that J. Cole's bragging feels even more gutless now with this shit. The fallout is not going to be in the same galaxy as Reasonable Doubt J. Cole. I'm not even the biggest Jay-Z fan. You've never been on his level. Especially when you have punchlines that you say and then you half-ass a quasi-explanation in the following line instead of letting the punchline stand alone. Is that for your benefit or for ours? Now the sub at Future on the second verse is all the more eye-rolling now alongside all the GOAT proclamations that will never be credible again and that's really the root of this. I've never found J. Cole's bragging remotely credible, something that even Drake could occasionally pull off, and now my disbelief is ironclad, because I don't even know how much Cole even believes it. And by the end of the second verse, he sounds hoarse. He's mocking a girl for having too many IG followers as proof she's clearly a slut he heard in the rumor mill. I mean, you probably have more IG followers than her, Cole. What does that make you for as much as you have given? And now you want to whine because nobody's given you anything. Which I thought for years you went on that you didn't need anything from anyone. Certainly does feel like crocodile tears. Maybe you should get back in the fucking swamp. Number 11, Wannabe by Glorilla and Megan the Stallion. White boy wasted, chin to tail. He don't want to be kept, don't keep it. He don't want the paper, then beach, don't keep it. Ho, I don't get left, I'm a girl, shit. Up me like Justin Bieber. You know, I'm so happy that Glorilla has real chart traction with a presence and sound that's somewhat distinct to her. Yeah, Glow continues to be really damn good. And when I heard she was teaming up with Megan the Stallion, who, let's be real, really kicked off all these diss tracks proper with Hiss, and that's probably still the best of them in 2024, I was kind of excited for this. And you know what, I cannot be the only one who appreciates the slight irony that she flipped Don't Save Her by Juicy J and Project Pat on the exact same week that J. Cole showed up on the charts and his credibility went up in flames. I still hate No Role Models, which is by far his biggest streaming hit. I will take this instead. Now I do wish they did a little bit more with the beats beyond that muffled beeping sound, the bells and the lumbering, if kind of clean trap percussion. But the real stars of the show are Glorilla and Megan. The former only coming into her own more as a tough talking bruiser. The latter with flows and internal rhymes that are actually considerably more quotable. Calling herself mother, that the trick is your daddy, and that the bitch looks like a female me on Etsy. <laughs> That's kind of funny. And the fact that two of them hype each other up pretty well it's effective and the central conceit of the song is strong they've got power now they're not saving the guys that are chasing after them glorilla's not simping for them anymore i respect that there's actual growth and yeah that leaves me thinking i really need to get to that glorilla album sooner rather than later because this is really good i hope there's more of it check it out and finally number six seven minute drill by j cole I got a phone call, they say that somebody dissing You want some attention, it come with extensions Real talk, I was more than a little surprised when J. Cole dissed Kendrick And I wasn't exactly happy with how he did it but I was pleased he made the attempt. I like competition in rap. I like wordplay. I like sparring. I knew it was never going to get super personal or in the streets. And at the end of the day, Kendrick and Cole would make peace, probably tour together in a couple of years. We know how this goes. I don't think any of that's in the cards anymore. Sure, Cole and Kendrick might still be friends, given how much click hopping Cole appears to have done. But the refusal of the call speaks volumes. But before we actually get into that, let's acknowledge that seven minute drill, as well as not being seven minutes, it's not particularly good. The bleeping synth and gurgling bass and brittle percussion along the bells, it sounds really cheap and canned, something built more for bad pop rap by Dr. Luke. And while the conductor beat switch was welcome, I don't think you make up for having no energy to open up your diss track. It shouldn't sound like light work. You coronated the big three, Cole, so why are you going at Kendrick catalog especially given how much you spent of the 2010s actively trying to rip him off if you don't want or care about prestige why are you saying fuck the grammys at all especially given that they've screwed over kendrick multiple times as well why isn't there solidarity there and why are you still making jay-z references as if this is in the same ballpark as takeover and for as much as you brag that you got a's in math on your album how is your math and counting album still wrong in multiple places on 
on this song. But hey, you know what? I actually think the rest of this diss is kind of decent. He sounds morose and dismissive. He doesn't want to do it, but he will if he must. The Stone Temple Pilots line, I thought that was good. And I don't mind the constant implication that Kendrick Lamar is not fully who he says he is to the general public. Because I absolutely believe there is more dirt there than Kendrick fans want to admit. Kendrick's often implied it himself. But then J. Cole apologized. And forget the obvious lie that Cole could drop two classics right now when he doesn't have anything close in his catalog to indicate that. It's revealing of truth, no facade. Because to me, J. Cole's never been that guy beyond just a mid-tier rapper who got hype behind surface-level introspection, tedious production, and a series of admittedly impressive verses against weak mainstream competition. And I've been saying that for a decade now, and a lot of coal miners got in their feelings in my comment section about it. I mean, is this your king, who is now whining about cancel culture with transphobic bars that are only slightly more embarrassing than the Rick and Morty lines, unable to grapple with Mr. Morale and the Big Step because that's actually an album about doing the work in the introspection, trying to make yourself better rather than pay bad lip service to faux enlightenment, having more smoke for No Name, where J. Cole flat out admits that he doesn't read. Because from here, looks like he was conflicted, misusing his influence. And honestly, I feel a little bad for y'all who bought in. It sucks when all the bragging is built on sand. It sucks for you, especially if you put your faith in it. With the coup de gras that... He left this up just long enough that he could get a full tracking week and chart. Hey, J. Cole, I thought that didn't matter. Again, I could say I told you so. But the sad truth is that people tell you who they are. Cole's been saying it for years. And again, this, just indicative of everything J. Cole has been all along. And that ends the week. Starting off with the worst, J. Cole's only getting dishonorable mention for HYB with Central C and Boz, mostly because for all of my vindication at this fall off, it's still better than Cry by Benson Boone. God, that song's terrible. Best of the week is much simpler. Good Luck Bay by Chapel Roan, and a tie for honorable mention between Wannabe by Glorilla and Megan Thee Stallion, and Helen Back by Bakar and Summer Walker. That was a really nice surprise. I'm surprised it actually really stuck for me. Now next week, Okay, I've already made the fall-off joke too many times. We potentially have another future and Metro Boomin' album bomb coming, so stay tuned for that. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.